Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live. Gosh, 83,000 views on the teaching I did on uh, Now You Know Who the Antichrist Is. You know, the video just went viral overnight when I shared it. It's actually one of our Patreon videos. I don't normally, or I'm getting more and more to where we don't share as many Patreon videos here publicly. Um, there's some reasons behind that. I'll share that with you later. But today, this video kind of recaps some of that. But we're going into the beast as well, and even the mark of the beast. Because I think I may know exactly, uh, not technically what the mark of the beast is. But you're going to know after you listen to this video where it comes from. And you're going to understand better the Antichrist, the beast itself, who the false prophet uh, is of Revelation, uh, the man of sin, 2 Thessalonians. Uh, we're going to dive into every bit of this. It's a battle. It's really a battle, friends, and it's a battle that we've got to get ready for because deception is coming. Uh I think the title of the video, and I don't know for sure yet, but now you know what the mark of the beast is, may be the, the title of this video. Um, in a way, I should say even the beast, but uh, that's a little bit different. But the mark, I think we can identify it uh, very much similar to that of uh, the Antichrist. Because think about it, the Antichrist, what, why do they use that expression, Antichrist? Well, the Mashiach, the Christ himself, Jesus... There is an anti-version of him, a false one, a false Christ. Hmm. Maybe a false prophet. Another way to look at him. Uh, but if that be the case, then the mark of the beast must be an anti-mark. Ha! Ah, what do you know? All right, we're going to take a deep dive into this. Uh, I got this timeline uh, on the prophets up here for you. Uh, I'd actually made the statement the other day that Daniel was a contemporary of Ezra, but uh, when I looked at the actual timeline here, I realized, nope, sorry, can't be a contemporary. They're 100 years apart uh, or about 75 years apart. But it's still because of the Babylonian captivity is what I was thinking of in my mind. I just did not realize that Ezra was actually about 75 years later uh, at the time, or at least his ministry. I uh, don't know exactly where he jumped in on this uh, because Daniel did go down into Babylon. They were 70 years down there. So, uh, you know, so they had to have been pretty close together regardless of when Ezra began to speak about things. But Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel, they do all overlap. Ezekiel clearly prophesied in the days of Daniel. Daniel was prophesying while Jeremiah was prophesying. Uh, Jeremiah, though, even before the captivity, Daniel before the captivity, uh, and then they go into captivity. So it's important to kind of understand that, uh, and, uh, and especially when we're looking at, uh, I find that interesting, they call it, they put there the fall of Babylon. Well, no, the real fall of Babylon is more spiritual than it is a physical fall back then. So we're going to be getting into a lot of these things here today, but I just wanted to kind of throw that in there for you to get started here. And then where we're going to start at is the Ezekiel chapter 9. All right, Ezekiel chapter 9. And hopefully I don't forget what I have got in here and why I have it here. Ooh, I just now remembered something here on Ezekiel chapter 9. You want to talk about a shocker. Let's get rolling right away here. I got my tea here ready to go. Uh just in case. And I've got an amazing testimony to share with you guys at the end of the broadcast. Amazing, amazing testimony. Uh, myself personally. Uh, so anyway, let me, let's get into this. Ezekiel chapter 9. Then he called in mine ears with a loud voice saying, Cause ye them that have charge over the city to draw near every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way 
of the upper gate, <clears throat> which lieth toward the north, every man with his weapon of destruction in his hand, one man in the midst of them clothed in linen with a writer's inkhorn on his side. And they went and stood beside the brazing altar. And we're going to come back to this in just a moment. And by the way, like I said, the antitypes, right? Here we go. And the glory of God of Israel was gone up from the cherubim, whereupon it was, or the cherub, excuse me, not cherubim, but the cherub, the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed in linen who had the writer's inkhorn on his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. And the others, he said, in my hearing, go ye there through the city after him and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have you pity. Slay utterly old man, young man, the maiden, little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the elders that were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go you forth. And they went forth and smote in the city. And it came to pass, while they were smiting, it was left that I fell upon my face and cried and said, Ah, Lord God, will you destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? You know, the sad thing is, what's happening in Israel today is very much the same. But the problem, if you look here, God was bringing the judgment not upon the the people in the surrounding countryside. He wasn't pouring it out on Palestinians and he wasn't pouring it out on, on the Arabs, the Iranians or the Turkish or the Jordanians or the Syrians or whatever it might be. It was being poured out upon their own people. Now, I have some issues here. I'm not going to go into those issues right now. But I will tell you, you really ought to think about this. But I want you to think about this, too, in light of the mark of the beast. Not only that, notice. He says, then called in my ears with a loud voice saying, cause you them that have charge over the city to draw near to every man with a destroyer weapon in his hand. And behold, how many men come up? Six men came from the way of the upper gate which lieth toward the north, every man with his weapon of destruction in his hand. And one man in the midst of them clothed in linen with a writer's inkhorn on his side. So how many men were there? Seven. What's fascinating about this, you're looking at a prefigure of the seven Noahide laws that will be brought about here in the last days. <clears throat> Out of the seven Noahide laws, six of those laws are all about laws, if you violate them, according to the Talmud, you're to be put to death for violation of any of the six laws. By decapitation, that is exactly what is written in the Talmud about six of the seven Noahide laws. Why not seven? Because the seventh one is to set up judicial system for carrying out the justice. The man in the midst was clothed in linen with a writer's inkhorn on his side. He is the man that represents, and this is the way, by the way, this is what Israel is going to do when they go to get ready to carry out these seven Noahide laws. They're going to come back to Ezekiel's prophecy and they're going to type this to you that there is a penalty of death. And then they're also going to come back to you and they're going to tell you 
according to the judgment of that law, because that judge of that law is going to bring out the anti-Semitism law. But if you speak not against Israel, if you are not anti-Semitic, you will be given a mark. In this case here, And the glory of God of Israel was gone out, right? Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads. A tav. This is right here. The word tav, and it comes from the letter tav. That tav was being put on the foreheads of all those. That had, already been, <clears throat> that had already been crying for the abominations that were done in the city. <clears throat> uh, the odd thing is, right now, the people like Smotrich and Ben Gavir and Netanyahu and all of his right-wing coalition that are trying to bring about a theocracy, bring out their Frankist uh, Sabbatean doctrine, do more evil that the Mashiach might come, they are the ones that are truly carrying out the evil, but it's not going to come out like that. What is going to come out in the antitype is that if you speak against them and what they're doing, then the six men with the swords or the six Noahide laws that you have violated will cause you to lose your head. <clears throat> but the justice, though, will give you mercy. Now, let's take, let's take a look at something here before I get into these other parts here. Uh, <clears throat> Because we know that <clears throat> the mark of the beast Let me make sure I get this just right here. I gotta find where that's at. Get rid of the word of. Don't need the word of in there. Why is it not pulling up? <clears throat> Well, I'll tell you what. I know over here we have one part here. Okay. Okay, forehead. That's the word I need to put in there. I want to get the... Uh, it's only there. Let's see. Hmm. Okay. Okay, it's in Revelation thirteen sixteen. And so let's pull it up separately. I just wanted to make sure that we start where that mark is at. Okay. And he doeth great wonder. Okay, this is important too. And I behold another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. He spoke as a dragon. He exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and he causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. By the way, we might as well go ahead and hit this as well because there's so many different ways that you have to look at this. All right, we're in Genesis. Let me go to Genesis chapter 3. If you remember the prophecy, um, let's see. Okay, right here. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. So there's going to be children on both sides. We know the fallen angels came down, cohabitated with, with women on the earth and produced a, a lineage and an offspring. We know that according to, um, 
Oh gosh, where is it at there? Where um, that the Nephilim, and I do not. Let me see if I can find that for you real quick too. Uh, that is in the book of is it Deuteronomy. Let me try this real quick. I think it's Deuteronomy 18. Let's see. I want to process. No, it's not there. Oh, goodness. Enoch, that's who I'm thinking of. Let me let me pull up. Not Enoch, but Enoch. I'm not spelling his name right. And I think English uses giants. Oh, I think it's chapter 13. Yeah, it's Enoch. Here we go. Chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. All right, let me let me take you to the right place here. I got to kind of do this, and I, I apologize because it's going to make it a very long video here, but you've got to see this so you understand everything. And there we saw, this is when, by the way, when Joshua and Caleb and the, and the ten spies, they go out to spy out the land. They come in there. They bring back the report. There's giants in the land. Verse 33, it says, and there we saw, didn't say they saw, didn't say they saw, well, we've got it in English, giants, but he actually says Nephilim. We saw the Nephilim, the sons of Enoch, not Enoch, Enoch, right there is his name, A-N-A-K, okay, sorry. All right, sons of Enoch. By the word, wait, the word Nephilim, we know it because it has a yod right there. Bene Anak, sons of Anak, and he is from Min Ha, not Nephilim. That's an incorrect way of writing that because Moses didn't put the yod in there like you have in the blue highlighted here. Between the Fe and the Lamed, there's no yod here. It's he, Anak is from the Fallen ones. So it should be Hanafalim. Not Nephilim. Nephilim are the children of the fallen angels. But Anak, he is from the fallen angels. So it would be Hanafalim. All right. And we were in, a, in our own sight as grasshoppers. So were we in their sight. All right. So the thing is, there were children of the fallen angels even after the flood. I mean, that's what Moses wrote in the book of Numbers. Take it up with him because that's what he said. I can't change that. Now, the important thing is, though, right here, though, is now it says here, they shall bruise thy head. All right, that's how they translate that in English. They shall bruise thy head. Totally incorrect translation. In Hebrew, right here, if I can get it to quit highlighting on me, Right there. Hey, Vav, Aleph, who? That means he. You cannot make that say they if you wanted it to. You have to say chem. Chet mem. All right? He. Ya shofach. He will bruise your head. Whose head? Rosh. Yafach. Rosh. And you shall bruise their heel. Now that, that is a there there. Why? Because it wasn't just Jesus. It was him going after the believers. So it's a prophecy that the serpent is going to have a head figure in Israel at the time of the coming of the Mashiach, the Messiah. Well, what do you know? You want to see that that's true? Because... God's already said, I'm going to put hatred between your children and uh, the woman's children and, and your children. Okay. Well, let's take a little look at this, right? Matthew 24. Or no, 23, excuse me. Matthew chapter 23. Right? And that's exactly what we have. 
we have, I think, verse 33. Jesus says, Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill you up the measure of your fathers. You serpents. You generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? He's bruising the head of the very serpent because the serpent would be there in that day. Wherefore, behold, I send to you prophets, wise men, scribes, some of them you shall kill and crucify, some of them you shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. That's them bruising the heel. Their heel. Not just Jesus's, but those that are the believers of his. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of what? Righteous Abel. And to the blood of Zacharias, son of Achaias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. So Jesus takes and puts that blood guilt all the way back. Why? Because they are a generation of vipers. And what is a viper? What is a serpent? He is a beast. The mark of the beast. And of course, the, 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 the beast received the wound to his head. His authority the Pharisees, Jesus came and caused them to tumble. He caused the second temple to be destroyed and brought down. The beast, the serpent, had been wounded. But he didn't die. Whose deadly wound, you would have thought Israel was done with. It's 70 A.D. When the Romans came in and they sacked Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, burnt the city to the ground. That deadly wound of that beast, but that deadly wound would be healed. You know when it's really going to be healed? When they build the third temple. When they have this war with Lebanon and they'll blame Lebanon for the Dome of the Rock being struck and destroyed. That's just my conjecture. but it will be an inside job. Just kind of like what happened to the Twin Towers. Somebody else planted the devices. If the planes couldn't knock it down, let's make sure we blow it up. Think about that. So Ezekiel, we find out there are six men with swords, the Noahide laws, the six Noahide, there's seven Noahide laws. One is about setting up peace is to set up the judicial system. And they will decide, they will determine the mark of those that are righteous. They're not really righteous, but they serve the purpose of the beast kingdom. Now, let's take a look at this. Revelation. He exercised all the power of the first beast before him. Hmm. He caused the earth, them which dwell therein, to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Because that's who was over Jerusalem. And it's, isn't it odd? They're trying to take and bring Jesus down. You ever pay attention like Israel 365 and others out there that are trying to, they're pushing Jesus down just to a little good old altar boy. He's like a Catholic boy, a little altar boy. You know, he's really not very much of anybody. But after all, he is Jewish and he kept the law and you need to keep the law. They're going to, boy, they're going to they're gonna change Jesus. They're going to totally change him completely around from what you thought of him. And they're going to mold him the way they want you to think he is so that you'll believe a lie. He doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. He deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. Jesus came with a sword. Not a sword physically. It was his word. The word of God is sharper, more powerful than any two-edged sword. 
piercing asunder even the dividing of the bone and marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. He knew the thoughts and intents of their heart. He knew every single bit of it. He had certainly wounded the beast. Every evil imagination they had about him, he knew what it was. There was that sword. There was that sword wounding that serpent the entire time. But this one comes. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many would not worship the image should be, put, should be killed. Oh, if you're going to hold to Jesus and believe that he's the son of God, do you remember what Caiaphas did when, the, when Jesus, he said, are you the son of God? He didn't even say he was the son of God. He said, thou sayest. He ripped his clothes apart and he said, what further witness do we need? You've heard his blasphemy for yourself. He is guilty of death. And they sent Jesus out to be crucified. Hmm. So if you think that Jesus is still the Son of God at that time, yeah, that's one of those six men with their swords. By the way, that's a 21st degree mason. I'll bring a lot more out about that after there's some shackles put on somebody that I know. He causeth all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Wow. There's Ezekiel. There's Ezekiel. They set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sighed and that cried for all the abominations that are done in the midst thereof. All right. Pay attention, friends. Please pay attention to this. He causes both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. It's going to be so religious. The mark is going to be an identifying mark that they will know that you support Israel. And if you are anti-Semitic in any way, you will have violated one of their laws and you will be killed. Why do you think in the United Nations the Poway rabbi was up there proclaiming the seven Noahide laws. There are already laws against uh, hate crime in the United States that would have punished the man regardless. Do you need seven Noahide laws? He wants seven Noahide laws because the beast is working on taking over the entire world. For a period of time, it will be given unto him that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark. Not just the mark. You can have the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that understands count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Now, I used to identify that with vicarious filii dilii as far as the Roman pope, which is, if you break it down, the Roman numerals there, it is 666. But there's so many things that could line up to be 666. But one thing I guarantee you, you are going to find out. It's not going to have nothing to do with the Vatican. The whole beast system, Jesus identified it for you. Matthew 23, Matthew chapter 12. By the way, they're going to rewrite your Bible and take all that out. That's considered anti-Semitic. Can't have Jesus being anti-Semitic, can we? So anyway, there was another, okay, that was it there. So let's, let's move on now. In Revelation chapter 11, they have power. This is talking about the beast as well, right? This, this, I'm sorry, this is where you're, you have your two witnesses. And by the way, the two witnesses are very real. We found, I found this in the um, Apocalypse of Peter. There are three different types of writings. One in the, in the Egyptian Nag Hammadi, it's a little different. The apocryphal one uh, that is the uh, Apocalypse of Peter speaks about 
the two witnesses coming because of the house of Israel. Now, the house of Israel was in the days of Peter when he stood up on Acts chapter 2. He said, Be it unknown unto you, O house of Israel, this same Jesus whom you have crucified has made both Lord and Christ. But what was that a fulfillment of? O Israel, though you be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall return. That was the remnant. But then there's the other scripture that says, All Israel, in Romans 11, shall be saved. And then I found in second, or excuse me, in uh, the, it's actually, I think it's in the second chapter of the Apocry Apocrypha, or Apocalypse of Peter, where he wrote about the fig tree, when Jesus talks about the fig tree, and he says, tell us who this is. He said, it's the whole house of Israel. That's where all Israel be saved. And what happens? Those that are still left of their descendants that came down through time, they will begin to wake up that what is going on in Israel is a lie. And they'll lose their life for it. That's where the fifth seal is fulfilled, by the way, where there's souls under the altar that says, how long, O Lord, until you bring that judgment upon those who killed us? And Jesus says in there, he said, wait for a little season until the same thing happens to your brethren. That's the apocalypse of Peter in the house of Israel. And he says, and they will become martyrs. <clears throat> That's another subject, another time. I'll get into that a little bit later. Anyway. Uh, I brought this out, let's see, for the beast's sake here. And when they have finished their testimony, talking about the two witnesses, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the great uh, street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Keep that in mind, because we're going to get into this a little bit later about Sodom and Egypt, because the streets of Jerusalem are being typed with that. And they of the people and the kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies in uh, three days and a half, and they shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. That's the two witnesses there. Um, let's move on. He had, <clears throat> this is in Revelation 13. And he had, let's see. Uh, try to see if I'm missing anything before I start on this. Again, we've already gone into the being the wounded of the head. He opened his mouth, blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and them that dwell in it. Okay, this is what he did. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth and blasphemed against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Uh, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Now notice, it's given unto him to make war with the saints. How does he do it? What I just read to you in Ezekiel. They'll modernize that. They'll bring about the seven Noahide laws. And the man with the ink horn, he will be the judge that determines whether or not you've been marked for good or bad. He will give a declaring law that says who is good and who is bad. That is the mark. You don't even have to have a physical mark in that regard. That is the mark itself. Whatever he declares. That's why it says not just a mark in your forehead. He says you could have his name. You could have the number of his name. What's the name? If you're Jewish, you're marked. Doesn't make Jewish people bad, by the way. But by the way, the reason why I said, you know how you know that? Said the, the, you can be marked in your forehead or in your hand, or you could have the name. Because see, Jews are not under the seven Noahide laws. Under the seven Noahide laws, you only need one witness against you. As a Jew, you have to have seven witnesses. Totally different set of rules. 
Okay. And he opened his mouth and blasphemed against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. By the way, his tabernacle is the body of Christ. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. That's because they'll make that Noahide laws universal, which they're working on doing right now. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And if any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. I suspect that this could be the Antichrist. It's a, it's a suspicion. He deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live, because Christ did wound him. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast beast should be killed and he causeth all both small and great rich and poor free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads and that no man might buy or sell save that he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name all right so there you have it right there now i want to show something to you here we're going to jump back over here to daniel chapter 7 again this is where I got into that message about, and now you know who the Antichrist is, right? <clears throat> Daniel chapter 7. When we get down into here, uh, I beheld, uh, verse 21, at the same uh, horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Concerning the ten horns that were at his head, and on the horn which came up and before which three fell, even that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things, whose, whose appearance was great, greater than that of its fellows. And notice, the other horn which came up. I think that's exactly what you're looking at in Revelations. He had two horns like a lamb. Now, notice that too. Let's jump back over to Revelation just for a moment here, right? Let me back up to where that was. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me just look it up real quick to make, make it easier, okay? because I don't want to be sitting here going back and forth. Revelation 13, 11. Okay. I know, I know I'm in the right spot there. I just got to get the right verse. Here we go. And I behold another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. If he's like a lamb, and Jesus Christ we know as the lamb of God, then he is the Antichrist then. And then if we look at Daniel chapter 7 here, and there's ten horns, but then the other horn which came up before which th uh, three fell, there's another one coming up. Could that be one and the same? And even that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things, whose appearance was greater than of its fellows. I behold, in the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High and the time came and the saints possessed the kingdom. Sounds like Christ coming to judge him, just like we read in the book of Revelation as well, where Jesus comes down and he's called King of Kings, written on his thigh. And he comes on a horse with angels coming from heaven to bring about judgment upon that beast. Thus he said the fourth beast, 
shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all the kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Why? They crush it under the seven Noahide laws. And as for the ten horns out of this kingdom shall ten kings arise and another shall arise after them and he shall be diverse from the former and he shall put down three kings and he shall speak words against the most high. Wow. Sounds very much like this other scripture we read, right? And he shall think to change the season and the law. That law is a decree. Now, I have found when I was looking at the book of Ezra, there are places where even God is, they use that word dot as a decree. But it is very synonymous to kings to give a decree. They shall be given into his hand until a time's time and a half a time. And what decree is he thinking that he can change? This Antichrist that rises up, he thinks he can change the season and the decree. Artaxerxes, through Ezra, had given the decree to go back and restore Jerusalem and build the second temple. He didn't know it, but it was for the coming of the Messiah, the true Mashiach. But this guy right here, Daniel, speaks about this fourth kingdom that's going to be diverse from all the other kingdoms. He calls it what? The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be a diverse from all the kingdoms. And it's a beast as well. And it devours the whole earth. And he But in order to devour the whole earth, he's got to get that third temple built. So he changes the season in that decree that was given by Artaxerxes. And by the way, I'll show you where Artaxerxes gives that decree. I think it's right here. Let's see here. And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thy hand, appoint magistrates and judges who may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God. Now, he does say the decree. And teach you him that knoweth them not. And whoso will not do the law the decree of thy God and the what? The law, the decree of the king. Let judgment be executed upon him with all diligence. Where, whether it be unto death or to banishment or to confiscation of goods or to imprisonment. Wow. That's almost like can't buy or sell as well, isn't it? And even being put to death. Or even being banished. So if he's talking about a decree of God, it's certainly not the Torah that Moses wrote. Why is it? Why is the only place we have God has to have a decree is in the book of Ezra? And I think one place in Daniel as well. It's definitely not talking about the Ten Commandments. But this is where he gives that decree to go back and to rebuild and to restore Jerusalem. Let's see. Okay, here it is right here. Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be done exactly for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? This is why he wanted to get this, this uh, temple established. Artaxerxes didn't know it, but Jesus Christ was coming. Also, we announce to you that touching any of the priests and Levites and the singers, porters, Nethanim, or servants of this house of God, it shall, be, it shall not be lawful to impose tribute, impose or toll upon them. I thought that was kind of interesting. And thou, Ezra, 
After the wisdom of thy God that is in thy hand, appoint magistrates and judges who may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God. And again, it's not laws. It's not the Torah. It's the decree. The decrees of thy God. I'm a bit perplexed, but they do attach it with the building of the temple. So we'll leave it kind of at that point there. Let me move forward with you. This is going into Daniel chapter 9. And we have to do this one as well, because again, we're looking at the beast. We're looking at uh, the beast being, obviously, he is most likely... The Antichrist. Or is it the false prophet? Know you therefore and discern that from the going forth of the word to restore and to build Jerusalem unto one anointed a prince shall be seven weeks. And for a three score and two weeks it shall be built again with a broad place and a moat. It doesn't say the word moat anywhere in Hebrew there. Period. Zero. There is no ditch going to be dug around the temple, but in troublous times. And I brought this out the other day because it really kind of bugged me, right? Okay. We know that there's going to be one anointed a prince, okay? Anointed a prince. That's the Mashiach. Ad until Mashiach, okay? So he says... Ad Mashiach until Messiah Prince. Okay, that's what it says. Ad Mashiach Nagid. Nagid means Prince. Okay, Jerusalem until Mashiach the Prince. There's going to be 70, uh, shall be seven weeks, excuse me, uh, Shivim. Shivua. That's 70 weeks. Okay, and for three score and two weeks, and it shall be built what? Again, and this is where it gets interesting. Tashuv, Verni Benatah, Rachov, the street, okay, Vechavutz, uh, which is, um, oh gosh, that word there is. Uh, I believe it means earnestly, if I remember right. Uh, it's not, see, the thing is, they don't translate it right over here at all. But the one word, though, that catches my attention is this one right here. It shall return, let's see. They, they translate it as being built, and it, could, and it can be built. It could be that, because it actually says tashuv, to return, and you shall return and you could say build, build the street, um, but it has nothing to do with the word moat. It doesn't have anything to do with the word, with the word they're translating broad place, the word rechov, which is a street. But it, it does say in troubling times. But the reason why this word bugs me too is also you shall return, and it's almost like it's like to bring forth children. Now that's interesting. The only reason I kind of wonder if that could be the real implication behind that is because the Messiah coming, he's actually built, he's the one that builds the real temple. And what does he do? He brings forth children in that temple. You return, you bring forth children. I, I don't know. And there again, I, I still, I need time to really study that out. But it can be translated as built, okay? So I don't want to disclude the fact that it, it can be used that way, but it can be used either way. I'll actually show that to you. I mean, just so you know that, Brother Steve, you're not making this up. This is really true. I want you to see this for yourself. Let me go to uh, Daniel. Let's see here. Daniel chapter 9. And let's blow it up so you can see it big enough on the screen here. Let's go down to verse 25. 
Middle Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, shall be so. Okay, three square and two weeks, the street. Okay, there's your word. Let's see. All right, this is where they say the built. Okay. Uh, Bina, they put on there to build, literally and figuratively, begin to build, obtain children. Okay, right there. Obtain children, make, repair, or set up, surely. Now, how in the world you get obtained children in there is beyond me. But, you know, hey, H1129, let's just out of curiosity, let's just see uh, if we have a usage like that for obtained children. Uh, build a city, build, build city, build a city, build it, build it a city. Yeah, I'm not. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Right here. Genesis 16, 2. Hath restrained me from bear, uh, bearing, I pray you go into my maid, and it may be that I may obtain children by her. Wow. Okay, now see, here's the thing though, right? Now, if you look at that one right there, to obtain children, and it's actually being used for the promise of, in reference to the coming of the of the of the seed of, of of Christ, the seed of Abraham, which would be the seed of Christ to obtain children. So I can't help but wonder if it doesn't really have something more to do with that. So we got to really look at this later. I mean, this 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 is what gets me. This is what gets me when you go to read it in the original language. You find things that you're just not anticipating, right? All right. So anyway, going back though, so. All right, so the, so the thing is, the prince comes forth, but he's cut off. And after three score and two weeks shall anointed one be cut off. And Jesus is cut off in the midst of the week. Because why? You have to remember, there is a determined time in that last week that was determined for Israel. Jesus is cut off during that time. And be no more. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city of the uh, uh, and the sanctuary. Now, I kind of think that being the prince that shall come, uh, that destroy the city and the sanctuary, could have been the prince, of, in this case here, uh, it would have been the Roman, uh, uh, the Romans, when they came, they sacked Jerusalem, etc. They're the people of that, of, of that prince. Okay, but this is the end shall be with a flood. Okay, and he shall make a firm covenant with many for one week. We'll go into all that at a different time. There's a lot more to that than what meets the eye. So, uh, but nonetheless, Messiah is cut off. So there's still a determined time that is going to be finished up. And it's not been finished up as of yet. Okay, now <clears throat> we are now in the, uh, are we still in the book? Of, so the decree went forth and the wise men were to be slain. Okay. Okay, this was okay. I brought this one up here. This was to show you the other one here. Wherefore is the decree? So, okay. Uh, this is where also the word decree is being used for the part of a king. Uh, it's in the book of Daniel, it's in chapter 2. So the decree went forth, and the wise men were to be slain. Right there, dot. Okay, again, down here. Again, al madat. You know, wherefore is, or is actually uh, upon what is the decree of the king so so uh, hastily being done. Uh, so I wanted to share that with you there. Um, uh, again, a decree. This is the law of the Medes or the uh, uh, didat, uh, uh of the Lamadi la or the of the uh, of the Medes of Persia. OK, and the Medes and the Persia. Okay, so, and we already went over this part about Ezra. We got into that already. So we're just about here to the end here, guys, that I wanted to share this with you. Um, that was another timeline also that I'd found. It was very interesting. <clears throat> so now we are over here in the book of... Okay, oh yeah, oh yeah. This is another one that was interesting to me. We are in, I think it's in the book of Ezekiel as well. I need to look and see what chapter, Ezekiel chapter 29. <clears throat> Remember when I said to you, I want you to keep in mind the part about Egypt. Remember, they said, uh, they, they likened to when the two witnesses are killed, where it said also our Lord was crucified, but they called it Sodom and Egypt. Right? Sodom and Egypt. Speak and say, thus saith the Lord, behold, I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt. 
the great dragon that lieth in the midst of the rivers, that hath said, My river is mine own, and I made it for myself. All right? It's very important that you pay attention to what he says here. Uh, Son of man, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, Ben Adam. Okay? Uh, and you're setting your face, you know, Penecha al Paro, Melech Mitzram. He was the king, Pharaoh was the king of Egypt. <clears throat> Speak and say, Thus the, the Lord God, behold, I am against you, king of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Right? I'm just establishing this for you. I will put, watch this, I will put hooks in thy jaws and will cause the fish of thy rivers to stick unto thy scales. Does this not bring back a memory to you guys? Remember the book of Job? Remember Leviathan and his scales? Remember where Job speaks about, God says, I will put hooks in your jaws? Or actually, no, that's actually uh, Gog of Magog, I believe, right? In, in the book of Job, God says, can you put a hook in his jaw and bring him out? Hmm. So here we have Ezekiel using the very same terminology as what we see in Job. We see of the Gog of Magog war, I will put hooks in thy jaws and I will cause the fish of the rivers to stick into thy scales. And I will bring thee up out of the midst of the river and all the fish of thy river shall stick into thy scales. All right? I want you to just hold these thoughts right there in your mind. <clears throat> I will cast you into the wilderness, and all the fish of the river shall fall upon the open field, and thou shalt not be brought together nor gathered to the beast of the earth, and the fowls of the heaven have I given thee for food. And all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord, because they have been a staff of reed to the house of Israel. When they take hold of you with the hand and you do break and rend all their shoulders and when they lean upon thee and thou breakest and makest all their loins to be at a stand, therefore thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will bring a sword upon you and I will cut off from you man and beast. That one just kind of really stuck to me. Man and beast. You know, one day I was reading in the Egyptian writings and they quoted Jesus. And I don't know if it's in that book of Thomas I told you about. You know, in fact, recently, um, <clears throat> uh, Elaine Pagel, she was the very scholar, uh, Dr. Pagel was the very scholar that called the the Egyptian works that were found at Nag Hammadi, she called them Gnostic Gospels. She later said she regretted ever doing that. She said, now granted, there are some that are clearly Gnostic. She said, but five of the books that are there should have been called early Christian Gospels. You see what's interesting, one person can cause everybody to think one way. But that one person actually repented and said it should have been called the early Christian Gospels. Five of those books. Thomas was one of those. And of course, scholars have agreed. But she did say, she quoted Jesus when Jesus said, I speak to them in parables, talking about the rest of the world, but to you I speak openly. For it's given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven but to the rest in parables. She said the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, were public discourses where he never revealed those things to the public. John was kind of set apart. And then these writings, like Thomas and like others, Philip, etc., are considered those teachings that were kept secret. Anyway, just a thought to share with you. But he said, I will bring a sword upon you and I will cut off from you man and beast. The reason I brought that up, though, is because in one of those writings that she called Christian uh, Gospels, early Christian writings, 
Jesus actually said there are many humans or many animals in human form. Now, he said that in those writings there, and he obviously also stated it in Matthew when he said about the Pharisees, he said, you're a generation of vipers. That's animals in human form. And the land of Egypt shall be desolate and waste, and they shall know that I am the Lord, because he hath said, the river is mine, and I have made it. <laughs> I don't think he's actually talking about Egypt per se. Just a thought. Uh, <clears throat> don't know what to think about that. Anyway, in closing, uh, <clears throat> I want to bring up something to you here. Let's see real quick here. Uh, Revelation 14. Um, there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Friends, I, I tell you now, the deception, <clears throat> and I, oh, I, we need to bring up Thessalonians uh, real quick before I forget. Where do I have it at? I could have sworn I had it up here on my screen. <clears throat> here it is right here. Let me, let me share this with you. I skipped right over it. Didn't mean to. You be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. Now this part here, that day shall not come, is not in the text at all. That's added. So let's just read it in the yellow, the way it's actually written in Greek. <clears throat> that you be not, let no man deceive you by any means. For except there come a falling away first, that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God setteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember that? <clears throat> Let me share with you as well, those of you that are new to this channel here, over here in the Go Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. We're going to go to Matthew 24. And I got to do it from the Hebrew version because in the English version, you don't get the, the best part of this translation. <clears throat> Nehemiah Gordon clearly identified the Hebrew Matthew as a very accurate gospel because of the fact it matches the Hebrew better than the Greek does. And this gospel in Matthew 24, we know this is all about the end times. This gospel that is evangelical will be preached in all the earth for a witness concerning me to all nations, and then the end will come. But watch what he says. If you remember in the Greek version of Matthew 24, and I think, let's see, do I have it here? No, that's Matthew 23. Let me just quickly switch it over so you guys can see it. Next chapter, when we get to verse 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let him which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Okay? He just says the abomination. He talks about what Daniel spoke about. Okay? And Daniel does speak about that, that abomination of desolation. I think it's in chapter 12, those where he actually, or chapter 10, one, I forget which chapter, but uh, I did that in the other video, and I'll put a link to that other video. Now you know who the Antichrist is, but to save time. Now, there he says that, but here in the Hebrew Matthew, he said, this is the Antichrist, and this is the abomination which desolates, which was spoken by Daniel as standing in the holy place. Let the one who reads understand. And by the way, that's not just any understanding that he speaks about. Yabin, right here. That, whoops, sorry. That is a divine understanding. Let he that reads, Vehu kore yabin. And then he says up here, Zeha Christas. He said, this is the Antichrist. And then he speaks about 
out of the mouth of Daniel that he spoke of. And this, and this is the abomination which desolates. What's the abomination that desolates? The Antichrist. That's how you know who the Antichrist will be. Because the Antichrist is going to be the one that's all about the building of the third temple. He's going to be the one that tells you you have to take a mark. You know, he's the one that causes you to identify. In other words, what is that mark going to deal with? He's going to say to you, it's going to be like a holy thing, like Ezekiel, like the, the man with the ink horn. But he's the Antichrist this time, the man in linen with the ink horn. He's the Antichrist. And he's going to go forth and he's going to, he's going to mark those. He'll say, I want to, we want to know that you are for, they'll say like this, you're for Israel. You're not for the anti-Semitism. We're going to bring about the seven Noahide laws. Wow. Now they have what they call Noahides. They're leaving Christianity altogether. They're becoming Noahides. You're deceived. You've taken a mark. Wait till the Antichrist comes. You'll really see that mark come then. You'll see miracles that he will do. You will believe. I'm afraid that what's going to happen, you're going to think that he is the um, one of the two witnesses maybe. I don't know how Christians will try to play this out. But he's going to do a lot of the things that they were able to do. That's the Antichrist, the abomination that sits, stands in the temple. And they're gonna, he's going to cause you to take that mark. I think he's one and the same. The beast actually, though, represents Israel. Because it was a serpent. That's what Jesus identified them as. Listen, I, I really hope you understand all these things. And, you know, a lot of times we load our videos here on Patreon. Uh, we just did one recently, Encounters of the Fourth Kind with Ron Gunter. Very controversial for a lot of people, but I wanted his testimony to get out there. He's a wonderful Christian brother, but he's had some very, very serious uh, abductions that, uh, that are shocking to listen to. Uh, but also, too, if you want to support the broadcast... Uh, definitely, if you can, just donate online. It's the easiest, quickest way. I still have up here the interview from uh, uh, Phil, uh, Phil there, uh, survivor of the USS Liberty. Uh, you might want to check that out as well. But please help support the work. Danoon Institute, P.O. Box 156, Sunbright, Tennessee. It's above my head, too. Stephen Benoon. P.O. Box 156, Sunbright, Tennessee, 37872. You can click there and donate online. It's very simple to do. Uh, any credit card works. So when you get there and you see PayPal, don't be freaked out. It doesn't matter. You can donate with a debit or credit card just by clicking that right there. Okay. The other thing I want to share with you as well. <clears throat> In fact, it was Brother Ron Gunter, the guy I just showed you there on Patreon here. He's the very one. Uh, the man is a, he is literally a genius. He's got 142 IQ. Uh, he's an engineer. He is in LifeWave with me as well. Uh, he does incredible understanding uh, on how the patches actually work. Now, I got to share this with you because he told me the other day, um, you know, I've had some marvelous experiences with LifeWave. Uh, my wife was worried I had a prostate problem because I was waking up five, six times a night to go to the bathroom. Uh, I no longer do that. I can sleep through the entire night now. Uh, my vision, uh, it was 470, no, 425 left eye, 500 in the right eye, stigmatism, all that kind of good stuff. My vision has improved 50% better now. I have to wear 250 glasses now. Uh, I haven't even got a new prescription. I just went to 250s instead so that I can see without everything being, because in my glasses, I can't see through them no more. They're all fuzzy, whereas they used to work great. But the one reason I got into LifeWave was because of my back. I had a lot of problems with my back uh, because I got blown disc everywhere. And uh, I had, my left leg was almost completely paralyzed. And I found out that's why I had such bad swelling in my leg because the blood can't come back up. And so I started getting, I've already started getting some feeling back. 
And uh, it's kind of, in a way, it's kind of irritating in a way too because it kind of makes things hurt worse. Well, then I got though to where I was really struggling to walk very badly. If I go down at our house there, we have like about eight or nine steps that go up. I would really have to hold on to the rail really tight and I can only go down left leg first because I'd be afraid I'd fall down. And uh, coming up, it takes time, you know. And then Brother Ron said to me, he said, Brother Steve, he said, look, he said, what's happening to you is, yes, the X39 is helping you uh, recover in a lot of areas, but he said, you do need to balance your brain where you wear the, uh, not X39, but an Eon patch that they make. You wear that on top of your head. That'll help balance your brain. That'll make X39 help heal those discs faster. He said, you've had a slow progress because of that. But he said, I can tell you too what your problem is with your legs. He said, your brain is not communicating because of your injury. So the signals are not going from your brain to your legs to make them work. That's why you struggle to walk. He said, take the Eon patches, put one at the base of your skull on this side behind your ear, that side, and at the base of your skull in the back. Three of them. I said, well, can I do that one on the top of my head still too that they say that helps make your right and left side of your brain communicate? He said, you can still do that one as well. He said, but when you go to sleep tonight, when you wake up tomorrow, he said, you'll realize you can feel your legs again the way you used to. I got up the next morning, and normally when I get up, I sit there at the side of the bed for a while, because when I get up to go to the bathroom, it takes about 20 minutes for me to get to where I can start somewhat walking. And I would walk and I have to go really slow because it's hard to make my legs work. It's just like, it, it, he was right. My brain just does not communicate to the nerve endings in my legs. The first thing I noticed, I got up, I didn't even think about it. I was getting ready to go, to the, I had to go to the bathroom. I'd slept the whole night like I told you. And I just walked right to the bathroom like it was nothing. And then I realized it. I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I can actually walk without any problem. The ultimate challenge came when I came to the steps that go in and out of the house because we live in a trailer and you're on the mountain so you got a big incline and stuff like that so on the back of the house you got a long set of steps that go up right. I could run up the steps and I ran back down the steps like when I was 40 years old or 30 years old. I could not believe what had happened. I called Brother Ron up. I said, Brother Ron, I said, it worked. I said, it actually worked. He said, I told you it would work. And I said, how did you know? He said, he said, brother, he said, I, I do a lot of research, a lot of studying. And he said, I'm into these type things. He said, and I knew that the Eon patch, the, the wave uh, links that it works on when it reflects the infrared light back in your body, he said, I knew that it would cause your brain to get reconnected to the nerves in your legs. And he said, look, he said, those patches are unbelievable. He said, it's just you got to know what to do to make things work right. And uh, so I, I said, can you do it more than once? He said, sure. He said, sure. So I did it again the last night, got up this morning, no problem whatsoever. I can, I, I get up, I mean, I can feel the stiffness in my knees and stuff, but as far as being able to, my legs to work and go, and two, when I would drive in the car, when I'd get out, Yana would be worried about me. She would hold me because she was afraid I was going to fall down. I said, no, 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 let it, let me alone. I said, I'll be fine in a few minutes. It just takes a little bit of time to get my legs to work again. And uh, now I can go for the drive. You know, it's like an hour and 30 minutes to go from Sunbright to Knoxville. I can drive down there, get out of the car, and I'll walk just fine like nothing's no big deal. That's why I tell you, I'm not here to sell you a product. I'm here because I'm telling you, you have no idea how this will bless your life and change your life for you. Okay? It will really bless you. And if you've been on it and you didn't feel like you didn't have no experience and you just quit, that's when I found out recently why. People, there's a, there's five, they say 5% of people don't get an experience. They don't experience anything. And I found out why. That's because 
Normally they say it's stress that caused it in your life, that caused your blank brain not to connect right, right side, left side, or front to the back, whichever the case may be. Then I found out you could wear an Eon patch right on the center of your head, it takes about 30 days. It balances the brain, and then X39, those stem cells will activate like crazy, and your body will mend. Your body will repair itself. So if you want to get that, by all means, come join. I'll put the description a link in the description. It's lifewave.com forward slash Benoon. But you can shop. <clears throat> you can go in there if you choose to do X39. When you do X39, uh, choose whichever patch you want. It's $149 if you just do it retail. Guys, don't do retail. Don't, don't waste your money on retail because, you know, you can cancel it. It's super easy to cancel if you decide it's not working. Go ahead, become a preferred customer. That's You'll save $50 by doing that. When you add it to your cart, you just go to that cart right there when you come up here to the cart, and that's when you have the choice there. You're going to become a preferred customer. Click on it. If you want free patches each month, be a PC Plus member. They charge $20 for the year, and then they'll send you free patches for you to try other stuff as well. Now, if you're serious and want to do it as a business, then you can do the join button there. And I recommend you go gold immediately. If you can do it, don't wait. It's 500 bucks, but you get patches discounted for every one, right? Every one. Now, they'll automatically have in there 5X39. Forget that. Exit that out of there and start over. Go over here to your patches. Now that I've learned about the Eon, right, what I would recommend you do, if you got people you know with dementia and stuff, you're going to want X39 for sure. Get you maybe two, two X39s, one for you and one for your loved one. Get an X49. That's very important. If you've got somebody that's got dementia or something, definitely get carnosine. But because of what I learned with Eon, oh my gosh, I am sold on Eon. Uh, let me find it in here real quick. Here it is, right there. Get Eon. I would get two Eons. And you still got room for one more. In that case, get a glutathione, right? Now, you've, now you're set. You've got every... And by the way, the glutathione, if you've got a sore throat, put one on each side of your lymph node right here in the morning when you wake up. Sore throat to be gone. Bonnie Harvey will tell you that one for herself. She did it. I told her when she had a sore throat, she called me the next morning or texted me the next morning. Brother, it worked. She couldn't believe it, but it worked, right? And then you just check out. You go through the process there. If you have any problems, email me, benoonx 39 at gmail.com. I'll help you go through the process to sign up. I can only go so far. I'm not much further than this, but... Um, you know, and then not only do you get the patches, but if you share it with someone, you can earn income with it. And when people tell you it's a pyramid scheme, that's totally false. Uh, it can, you can also benefit from people that come under you. But I've got doctors, all they do is they sign up like this, but then they sell them, they, they have their, some of their customers, they sign up and become uh customers or they'll buy it in bulk and sell to their customer there's so that's the advantage of being gold you can do it many different ways but like i said i'm experiencing what this amazing product is doing and that's why i want to see you helped and if you go to our youtube channel Banoon x 39 we have some amazing testimonies there brother ron gunter by the way the guy that i showed you there on patreon <clears throat> that man there he said the other day if it hadn't have been that he tried the X39, he said, I wouldn't be here today. He had stage four kidney failure, heart failure, and a valve in his heart that had, was leaking so bad his doctor said he didn't expect him to ever live. Now his doctor is on X39. He saw Ron go to stage one kidney failure after four months of use. Congestive heart failure left him and the leaky valve no longer exists. His doctor said, I cannot argue with the blood work. And I saw his mom the other day, 91 years old, walking around. And she was almost bedridden 
and she started these patches and she told her son you're not taking them away from me anyway god bless you i love you guys i hope this has been a blessing for you and we thank you for your support of this work good day